Hi, in this short screencast uh, we'll um, do a short review of circadian photoreception in mammals. This is a little bit out of calendar if you look at the syllabus, but it's important to have this information to understand the contents, the, the historical context and the contents of the papers that you'll be reading for this coming week. Uh, I mean, for this uh, coming Friday. So, as we, as you all know, when we started talking on the very first class about circadian rhythms, we said that um, the fact that we had a free-running rhythm, like in this case, that we're, we have a mouse with a rhythm that is shorter than 24 hours under free-running conditions, when we have the ability of entraining this rhythm to a light-dark cycle to make it into a rhythm that has exactly 24 hours, we, um, we made the, the inference from that evidence that, in fact, there had to be some way of communicating light information or whatever the other, the side giver that you're using to entrain the clock with the clock, and we talked about the input pathways that do that. In mammals, as we'll see, most all the information that gets to the master circadian clock in the supracasmatic nucleus, and in fact into the brain in general, comes through the eyes. This is not the case for other vertebrates, and we'll talk more about this um, in the coming lectures, but the point is, in mammals, you can assume that all the light information, all the uh, photoreceptive information that gets to the brain has to go through the eyes. So, um, many um, years ago, and you will read this paper, there was this extremely surprising finding, and in fact there was a lot of reluctance to believe that this could be true, um, that in some blind patients um, there was normal entrainment of, circ of circadian rhythms, a normal inhibition of um, Melatonin. So this is schematically what happens in what we now call a totally blind patient. And this would be a partially blind patient. And, of course, for the patient himself, he's... Um, he or she would be unaware that he's partially blind. In fact, if you ask this patient whether he or she is blind, in this case it's a, a male, a man, um, they would say that they are totally blind, right? And in fact, they would be classified as clinically blind. However, when we start looking at the um, circadian rhythms, and this is the... Um, period of the temperature rhythm throughout many, many days, um, in fact, you know, two, two and a half months roughly, um, and you can see that this patient on the left has a period that is longer than 24 hours, which means that it's most likely under free running conditions. Until this paper was published, it was thought that all blind patients would be in a free running state, that is and we talked about this many times, if you deprive the clock of light information, then you can assume that that animal, or in this case this patient, will be in free running conditions. Um, however, these patients, as you can see in the self-reported sleep bouts, is trying to keep a schedule that it's a 24-hour schedule, and that schedule is indeed social imposed. In contrast to this patient, if you look at the patient on the right, and you will go deeper into this in, in, in your discussion of the paper, you can see that this patient not only is keeping a 24-hour schedule in, its, in his sleep, but also that, uh, in this case, the melatonin minima um, show also a 20, an exactly 24-hour rhythm. So this is very different from this, indicating that in this, this patient is most likely untrained. And in fact, when you bring them, the two patients to the lab and you do use an assay in which you inhibit melatonin with a light pulse, you will see that this patient that was under free running conditions, even when it was when he was living under normal um, outdoor conditions, 
um, in the lab, if you present a light pulse in the middle of the night, you cannot inhibit melatonin. But on the patient that you present a light pulse, in, on the patient that wasn't training, if you present a light pulse, you see a normal inhibition of melatonin. When this was published, in fact, it took quite a while to be published because um, reviewers would not, would, did not want to believe that a blind patient could actually synchronize his or her rhythms. But in fact, we now know that uh, this is true, and today we'll see how this happens. So, um, in order to understand that, because I told you that all information about light into the brain goes through the eyes, we need to first understand how the retina is put together. So, in the retina, there are tr three main functional layers, and these are the, this is first the outer layer, which is the layer where the classic photoreceptors, cones, and rods are located. Um, and this is the layer that, at, until then, it was believed to be the only layer to be photoreceptive. And in fact, it was called, because of that, the photoreceptive layer. Then there are sets of cells, which are called bipolar cells, anamacrine cells. You can ignore the horizontal cells for now. Um, that these two cell types get input from rods and cones, integrate it, process it, and then synapse on ganglion cells, retinal ganglion cells, or RGCs, which will take this information through the optic nerve into the brain. And in fact, this is the only, the only way to communicate light information from the retina, from the eye, to the brain itself. Um, and until um, the, the, the next papers that, were, that I'm going to be talking about were published, it was thought, thought that the only way for the retina to perceive light, the only photoreceptive, the only cells that were sensitive to light were rods and cones. However, there were some hints, not only these blind patients that could synchronize and inhibit melatonin, which, by the way, had the eyes and had retinas, right, but had damage to the retina. Patients that did not have eyes for ac because of accidents or congenital problems could not entrain or inhibit melatonin. So I said that the ganglion cells are the only way to get information to um, the brain. Um, there are two set of projections into the brain from the retina through retinal ganglion cells. There are retinal ganglion cells that will go mainly to the thalamus, to the visual thalamus, and this represents the bulk of the projections. These are very many thousands of neurons project into the thalamus, particularly in visual animals like primates, um, like ourselves, humans. There are many, many projections from retina ganglion cells from the retina to, um, to the thalamus, and this is the visual thalamus, and these projections are um, responsible for what we call cognitive vision. Cognitive vision is what we call also image-forming vision. And this is what um, you typically understand by vision. It's what you're using now to see this screencast. Uh, it's what we use to distinguish contrasts, depth perceptions, um, colors, etc. Then there is a subset of retinal ganglion cells, which are less only a few hundred from the retina, that project to other areas, and one of those areas is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is, as you probably already know, within the hypothalamus. And these projections are known to be involved in circadian entrainment, and it's a direct connection from your eye to your clock. There are also projections to another area that it's called the olivary pretectal
nucleus and this nucleus is involved in pupillary reflex This set of functions, and in fact, this, the, the projections to the SCN not only control the clock itself by entraining it, but they also lead to more projections that go to the pineal gland to control inhibition of melatonin. So this set of responses, and circadian entrainment, pineal inhibition of melatonin release, and the pupillary reflex are called non-image forming. Responses and they are called non image forming because they don't involve the making of a main image, your pupillary constraint, and also they are not conscious responses. You're not aware when you're entraining your clock with light, you're not aware when your pupillary constraint, you know, it only does it when light is shining on your pupil, and you're also not aware when the melatonin is inhibited by light, but it, but it does effectively. So, there was one classic experiment published in the 2000 where they generated a mouse um, line, it was a double mutant, that in which one mutation removed the cones, as it's shown schematically here, and the other mutation effectively moved the rods, removed the rods. So essentially what we get here is a mouse that did not have either rods and cones. So with all we knew about the retina so far until 2000, the prediction would have been that these animals could not should not entrain to um, the light-dark cycle, should not show inhibition of melatonin, and should not show pupillary reflex, because, in fact, if these were the only photoreceptors in the retina, then how could the retina convey light information if, didn't, if it didn't have cells that were sensitive to light? Turns out that uh, this experiment proved that prediction to be wrong. And in this case, what we have is the, um, the, the, a transversal cut of the retina, that is, the, if you take the retina from a mouse and then you cut it um, across, then what you will see staying in brown here is this layer, this layer here, which is the photoreceptor or the rod and cones. These are the cell types that are, um, at, until now, were believed to be the only um, photoreceptive ones. And these are stained for different, um, for, for different um, types of cells. In this case, we're only seeing cones in panel A. In panel B, we're only seeing... Um, another set of cones, and in panel C, we're only seeing rods. The point is that in the wild-type animal, you can see very nicely all these stained cells that represent the rods and cones that are in the outer part of the retina, which is actually, it's called the outer layer, but it's in fact on the back of your eye, uh, as, as it's shown in the schematic that I showed before. Um, in this no double knockout that these uh, researchers generated, you can see that the retina stain in the same way has all the recept the rod and cone layer gone. So all that brown stain in each one of the panels is gone. And this is simply to show that indeed they had removed completely the rods and cones. Not only that, they also did um, different... Um, they, they also looked at Western blots and PCR reactions. So here we have, um, sorry, these are, these are northern blots. So this is measuring mRNA for um, in the wild type, in a single knockout and in the double knockout in every single case. Just focus on these two. And what you see that in the wild type you have expression for the green uh, cone opsing, which which means that the cone, the green cones are there. Green cones are responsible for green vision, as they're as they're um, 
name indicate. Then uh, you also have the UV opsing, which is corresponding to um, the what um, it, it's a UV cone, another set of cone, uh, and you also have um, the rod opsing, which has several bands here. So the point of these blots is to show that in the double knockout, all these bands are gone. Okay, this is very faintly expressed and this is not expressed at all, okay? So that's another way of confirming that you have removed the cells that generate those bands, the RNA for those bands. The point of this figure is to show that indeed the mice that they will be using as knockouts indeed don't have any rods and cones, and the question is, well, how do they behave in a circadian fashion? And the summary of results is on the next figure. So in here, we'll be looking at three types of animals. Actually, let's focus only on, on panel B. Panel A shows the same thing, but as for a single knockout that also has degenerated clock, uh, cones and rods. But this is, in, in these panels, you will see um, a wild type group, a group of animals that don't have rods and cones, and finally, another animal that only has some left cones, just as a, as a control. But interestingly, these animals are all blind from an um, image-forming point of view. In other words, if you put them in a visual task, they won't be able to discriminate any contrast. However, when we look at how they respond um, to a face advancing light pulse, they show very normal responses. In other words, if you compare the wild type Y bar to the black bar, they're always undistinguishable, okay? And in fact, this is quite interesting. Um, in At very bright light intensities, each one of those is intensity one, two, and three, each time more and more intense. What you see is that at very bright intensities, the animals that have not ro no rods and cones respond more than the wild types. So these are wild types and these are no, no rods or cones. Okay. So this is quite interesting because this is showing that in these animals that don't have rods and cones so that we believe should not be able to see light, they are responding to a phase shift in light pulse better than a wild type animal. So obviously that indicates that they still have photoreception, photoreception at least for the circadian system. And in fact, there's one group that they added here in panel A, which is this group here, which is enucleated. And these are animals that have no eyes. So you surgically remove the eyes, and you see that indeed they have no response to light whatsoever, which means that in the animals that have no rods and cones, right, the light information is actually getting through the retina because if they remove the eyes, the animals cannot respond to light pulses. So that means that all light information, and I said this before, in these mice is going through the eyes, but when you remove rods and cones, the eyes um, still remain some ability to respond, at least in terms of circadian responses, they, they remain very normal. Not only this, if you do pupillary reflex in these animals, they will they will be normal. So the pupil will constrict relatively normally. And if you do melatonin inhibition, it will be normal too. Okay, and now, um, just before the Hatter paper that you will read for this Friday, what um, people had found, Iggy Provencio, working first in frogs, found that skin frog, frog skin, sorry, contains cells that express a, a new photopigment called melanopsin. Then he, he was curious to see where this photopigment was also expressed in the eyes of the frog, and he found that retinal ganglion cells 
which remember they were not supposed to be photoreceptors so in principle they shouldn't expect you, you shouldn't expect it, them to express any photopigment but indeed retina ganglion cells in the frog had melanopsin 2 not only in the frog but also in humans and all vertebrates indicating that the expression of melanopsin, which was a new photopigment, which apparently conferred photoreception to these cells, was expressed in the retinal in the retinal ganglion cells of all the animals, of all the vertebrates that we know of. Uh, um, the paper that you will read from Hatter uh, et al., in fact, uh, aims to demonstrate whether these cells that express melanopsin are photoreceptive or intrinsically photoreceptive.